All right, the NFL's opt-out deadline is today. We're following all the latest news, and we got some mid-round picks that you don't want to miss on today's show. Tune in. Hey, Foot Clan. Sometimes people, they, they stop me on the street and they say, Andy, what's in the UDK? Give me the details. That's what they say? They ask me. Yeah, and I give them the details, Mike. 100-plus player profile videos, all of our expert rankings and analysis, a top 200 list. We got risk ratings. We got those tier rankings, Jason. Oh, that's the most important. Custom league scoring, put in your settings, get your own rankings out of it. Printable cheat sheets, the ADP, all of our projections on every single player updated all the time. And then they're like, sir, this is a Wendy's. <laughs> <laughs> Check it out at ultimatedraftkit.com. Hey, it's Ron Jones II, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and you're listening to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Thursday, August 6th, 2020. The Fantasy Footballers. Oh, it's still 2020, huh? <laughs> still here. <laughs> Can I level with you, Mike? Absolutely. I know 2020 has been a bit of a challenging year. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. However, it is the year that DeAndre Hopkins was given to my Arizona Cardinals. Oh, I you, am, yeah. Okay. Okay. I am okay. confused because I thought it was all supposed to be bad, but that seems very, very good. Yes. Okay. All right. This good. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a good start to the show. Glass half full. <laughs> oh, well, you know. Let's get this thing started. Yeah. Sir, you're at a Wendy's. <laughs> <laughs> you can check out the Ultimate Draft Kit at ultimatedraftkit.com. We have a mid round madness show today. We're going to bring you. Uh, each of us have selected a couple guys between rounds four and eight. They're tough, man. The, mi the middle rounds are tough. You know, there's there's going to be a couple gems in there as long yes. as you can get the, the pickaxe out, you know, and mine the rock. You find those gems. Just keep going with perhaps, the analogy. Perhaps an emerald. <laughs> perhaps. Uh -huh. uh, but mm -hmm. but maybe, maybe you get some fool's gold. That's true. You don't I, want that. I did look back at last year. And where some big time players were going. Mid round madness, Austin Eckler. Mid round madness, Derrick Henry. Mm -hmm. These Co Cooper Cup. Yeah, there there are some big time players in those rounds. So we brought you, we're bringing you a couple of players each today on the show. Maybe get into some mailbag. You can find us on Twitter at the FF Ballers, Instagram.com slash fantasy footballers. Uh, Instagram's adding adding some reels. Oh man! Which is their? Uh, it's nothing to do with TikTok. It doesn't. No, because they're fifteen seconds. How dare you? Clips. It doesn't sound anything. It sounds different. Real so reels. Reels. It doesn't sound like TikTok. But we might put some hot reels up. You know, some maybe. Uh, probably. <laughs> we're, we're with the times. <laughs> YouTube.com slash the fantasy footballers. Subscribe. Click the bell. Here's a quick question for today. Somebody wants fab tips. Mm. Uh, one of our jointhefoot.com supporters asks this question. Yo, 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 ballers. Yo. I just entered my first league that uses fab. Any tips for how I should adjust my waiver strategy? Hmm. Thanks and keep up the great work. What do you think? What is so? What is a hot fab tip? I mean, first off. 15 seconds or less. I'm sorry. <laughs> first off, it depends on the league. Uh, are these uh, players all new? to the fab system because that will change things as well. And my tip for that is don't be afraid to spend some money in week one and week two. People, when they're brand new to the system. What if some of our listeners right now are brand new to hearing that term? Oh, free agent acquisition. <laughs> it's based. It's a water-based waiver system. <laughs> That's how it would be fob. Yes. <laughs> acquisition. <laughs> No, nah, I should not have provoked an explanation. That was my fault. Uh, it, it, essentially, it's a way for you to manage your waivers. You make a blind bid to add a player off the waiver wire, to acquire a player off, off of, of, acquire. <laughs> yes. off of off of the waiver wire instead of just having the the reverse order of standings where yes. you you have you have a, no say 
in who you're going to get off of the waiver wire. This makes it a little bit more fair, adds a huge element of fun and strategy to the league. We recommend it for everybody. But people who are brand new to it generally get a little bit greedy and, and hoarding with the money. So, number one, don't be afraid to spend it. But yeah, two, gun, gun shy, right? They want to yes. hold it till the end. They don't want to be left, you know, yes. and, without money. And you should have some money at the end. But like, let's say you are going into a league and they're used to it. You know, number one, stick around to the show because when we talk about waivers on every Tuesday's episode, we do break down our favorite players off of the waiver. We talk about how much of our budget would we spend. You're like, oh, no, I'll, you know, I'll throw down 12% to go after that player. But that, I mean, it's that's what it's about. It's about prioritizing the player that you want. And sometimes you have to make a decision of if I wake up in the morning and see that I have lost out on that player, then bid more. Yeah, that's that's the question that I think is really helpful is if I were to save to if I were to have spent two more dollars and get the player, would I be upset if I wasted two dollars and, and, and set your budget? But I, I agree with Mike. It's it's really when I think about the fab system, it's about the 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 timeline of the season. Like that's the tips and tricks that I have for the fab system is in the beginning of the year guys are just worth more. Uh, don't be afraid to buy them. They give you more weeks. If, if you were to get a guy after week one who becomes a valuable player for your team and you have him for 15 more weeks versus getting a guy right before playoffs who gives you one or two games, um, he, you know, if you just think about the dollar per week that you're getting for that player, it's, it's fantastic. And the other thing is I always save like five dollars of fab to go into my playoffs so if if i spent up big in the beginning and week four i'm down to five dollars in fab mentally i say i have zero fab dollars because i want unless i'm out of the running and need to get back into the running for the playoffs because and hopefully your league accepts zero dollar bids yes that, yes that should be on for every league there should not be a you have to have a dollar to claim someone off the waivers that's ridiculous all right let's get into the news News and notes from around the league. Some interesting news out of Las Vegas yeah. this morning, and I don't know what to make of it quite yet, but Raiders offensive coordinator Greg Olson <laughs> yes. said first-round wide receiver Henry Ruggs will start out doing some things in the slot. Yeah, hmm? uh, the team is very. It's interesting. The team's very excited, obviously, about. Uh, well, you got Tyrell on the outside, on one side, and you got Brian Edwards, another one of their rookie wide receiver draft picks. Uh, that has, you know, Mike. What did you say this morning? There's, there's a drum beat for Brian Edwards. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's been getting, you know, kind of not huge press, but low key things, and 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 Brian Edwards, uh, out of South Carolina, he at least you know by people i trust uh in the draft community cuz he he fell to the third round i mean he was an incredibly productive wide receiver a good wide receiver and there was just an injury situation that caused him to drop in the draft whether that's fair or not but the i mean the raiders still used a third round pick to get him so the implication here is that if rugs let's say he comes into the slot occasionally they say they want to move him around they're going to start him there well, Hunter Renfro is not going to be on the field in those situations. Correct. And a player like Hunter Renfro, who I think was thrown out as maybe the last round type of waiver flag type of player, he needs every snap he can get to have any type of value in a league. Yeah. So this really just throws some water on Hunter Renfro's potential PPR productivity. That's that's a lot of peace. Yeah, I, I, a lot, I, I a lot agree. Of peace. I agree that's that that was uh, great alliteration mm -hmm. and also that – this does the main takeaway here. I don't think is hyping up either of the rookies. I mean that that's a little bit, but it's really about you might want to take a shot at a different late round target than Hunter Renfro because if those two rookies are yeah, like Henry Ruggs, sure, <laughs> like, yeah, hundred I mean, percent, he becomes way more interesting. If they to manufacture me. opportunities for yes. him to be on the field, which they should, just get him touches in space and let him burn. Yeah, he very well could be overlooked right now. I know that he is uh, undervalued by by me because I, I saw him coming in as more of a, a speed guy with a limited route tree that would be utilized more akin to... Like a slot wide receiver? 
No, like a Ted Ginn, like a okay. you know, like a uh, John Ross, right? Some some speedster that's on the outside. So this moving him there uh, and manufacturing more targets might. I'm with Jason. Move on him that. up. A there, bit. There's been you know you mix the Derek Carr and John Gruden with speedster. You don't know how much he's going to be used. So I think this is sure. intriguing. Uh, the Raiders also let Jeremy Hill go, so he's yep, gone. He's, he's gone. gone. Uh, NFL beat writer Omar Kelly, after being asked about the Dolphins running backs, tweeted this. This is Jordan Howard and Matt Breida. They are two completely different backs. Insightful. Uh, I usually prefer Howard's style. I like big bruisers, but I'm told that it's Breida's work ethic, which is stellar. Uh, he'll be the lead back, according to one of his trusted sources. Which is interesting and. In the reason that this is interesting right now is with all the opting out that's happening to the Dolphins wide receivers, not that Alan Hearns or, or, or Albert Wilson were going to make huge waves and be these target machines in this offense, but you need someone to throw the ball to. And, and as you're losing actual capable, capable NFL wide receivers, like Matt Burita is a good pass catcher, and, and you have Chan Gailey, who uh, I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but it's like, he, his running backs combined always, almost always see over 100 targets. And Jordan Howard should not be seeing those targets, so he should be going to Matt Burita. Someone to throw the ball to. I didn't think of Jordan Howard. Um, <laughs> exactly. What's funny is perception-wise, you think, okay, maybe they want to get Matt Burita the lead back role. He's a little bit younger, right? No, they're the same age. Exact same age. Jordan Howard's been here forever and yet is still 25. That being said, other Dolphin news. Preston Williams. Uh, you know Albert Wilson and Albert and, right. and uh, Alan Hearns. Alan Hearns going away. The Dolphins came out in a report and said that there's no assurance that he'll be on the field for Week One. So Preston Williams just adding fuel to your like right. find a target. Like it makes me feel more confident about Devontae Parker and Mike Gesicki to start the year, and that's enough for me. If I think those two guys are going to be targeted for the first, you know, heavily like the end of last year for two, three, four weeks. That's enough for me to go out and get those guys, and I can right. pivot off of them if I get a signal that the team's bringing somebody else back, but it gives me more confidence is my point. Yeah, yeah. no, I agree. I agree. Those those two guys right now are probably undervalued in drafts. We'll see come draft day if they've skyrocketed in ADP or if they're still values. The opt-out deadline for the NFL is today at 4 p.m. Eastern time which means depending on when you have uh, turned this podcast on, it might be over. Mm -hmm. So all the implications of that deadline, if more players opt out, will be talked about on tomorrow's podcast. So that will be interesting to watch. There is uh, some consideration for later opt-outs for players that have kind of extreme circumstances. Change of circumstances is, I think, the phrase that I saw from the NFLPA. Health could be something in the family. Right. But... The general opt-out date is today at 4 p.m. Is there any other news that you guys want to talk about before we jump into our main segment? No, I think also, we're good. Say get get to the madness. Let's do it. This is blasphemy. This is madness. That drop is quite ironic for me today. Why is that? Well, just the timing of it. It was crazy because I turned on the podcast to listen to on the way into work mm -hmm. was the Hardcore History podcast with Dan Carlin. Oh. Talking about the Persians and the Spartans. Nice. So ties in pretty good. They He said nothing about draft picks in the fourth to eighth round. So, hmm. so. <laughs> Not a podcast I'll listen to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, let's jump into it. Who wants to kick this thing off with... Uh, their favorite player from the middle rounds. Well, I don't know that this is my favorite player from the middle rounds, but this is someone I wanted to talk about. I think he is a great target in the middle rounds, and I'll explain why. I mentioned him on yesterday's uh, mock draft as being a good pick. One of you guys got him. I wanted him. But Kareem Hunt, running back for the Cleveland Browns, is an excellent draft pick this year. I had someone on Twitter reach out to me and talk about, you know, when we were talking about the backups, you, your insurance options at running back, and we came up with the big three, Chase Edmonds, right. uh, Alexander Madison, and Tony Pollard. Tony Pollard. 
the question was, what what about like Latavius Murray? And I my thought was Latavius Murray and Kareem Hunt. These are players who are gigantic insurance policies. They will be fantastic. But they're not just that. They're actually better than those they're players. They're not drafted as a backup. No, the, you can get a start or, or two out of them. Well, you can get a start or two out of Latavius Murray. You can get a start every single week from Kareem Hunt. And that is the point that I'm making here today is that he's seen as this insurance option where if he's Chubb goes down, he's going to be great. And that is true, but that's what he's being drafted as he is so much more than that. Once once he got back last season, he had 62.5% of his games as a top 24 back. That was the 15th best score. It was actually, ironically, tied with Nick Chubb. Uh, and that and that you know that stat is tied with Nick Chubb's entire season, including the games that he didn't have uh, Kareem Hunt on the field with him. This is a guy in Kareem Hunt who is an exceptional back. I, I, you know, if it wasn't for the off the field issues, he Clyde Edwards Alaire wouldn't be a thing right now, and right. Kareem Hunt would be a top three, top four pick in fantasy football leagues. But now he's relegated to the role he's in, but he it doesn't take away his talent. And you saw that on the field last year. Uh, this is a guy who has been, I mean, look at his career right now. You had him come out as a rookie. He was the running back four. Then the following year, he was the running back 11. So both years, a top 12 running back for fantasy football. And then last year, obviously, he was suspended the, the first half of the season, had his bye week yada yada but when he came back as the backup to Chubb he was the running back 19 he was a running back two week in and week out you could start him you could play him and now they're talking about getting him involved as a receiving option e even more uh he's in the receiver meetings he is uh you know he could be the third wide receiver or the slot wide receiver plenty of times what? oh sorry I, I don't want to cut you off but I want to ask you a question yeah because yesterday on the show, you were very vehement. You wanted Kareem Hunt to fall to you in the draft. Yes. Now, I think you would have had you not pressed so hard. It was my bad. It was your – because I, I think I was going to let him go. One of the things that I'm curious about, your perspective on Hunt, is, look, you've come out and you've said you think Odell Beckham bounces back this year. They went out and they spent money on Austin Hooper, who's spending all his time with Baker Mayfield. We need Baker to, to take a step forward, except for the Stefanski offense produced 400 passing attempts last year. Is this a situation where, yes, Kareem Hunt, we know how talented he is. Are there going to be disappearing acts? Because if you have that many targets, and he's not, he, you know, he's not Landry, Beckham, Hooper, Chubb's got to be on the field. Yeah. Chubb has to be on the field. Are there going to be games where, you know, without a touchdown, Kareem Hunt disappears? Is my worry. Well, I, I think there will be games that he disappears. He had two busts games uh, last year. But the thing is, is if you're talking about a guy in this range, a mid round running back, is this every, where you think he'll go? By the way, absolutely. I do Seventh not. Round? I do not think he will. Seventh. Uh, I okay. don't. I don't think he will go much higher than this. He's been a value in every draft I've seen because of Nick Chubb. I just don't think people are going to really get on board and say I need him. When you're in your draft and you're in those rounds, you're looking at your starting lineup and you're saying, man. There's a good starting wide receiver here, or maybe I'll grab a tight end, or I'll, I'll you know I'll, I'll do these uh, these type of maneuvers where you're grabbing Hunt where you don't need him to start, but on a bye week, on a flex, on a good matchup, you can start him anytime you want, and he is a home run league winning pick should something happen to Nick Chubb who has been injured before and gets a ton of uh, work. And to speak a little bit to your question about. Well, I, I think Odell Beckham is going to bounce back. The offensive line has gotten so much better. Maybe maybe there will be fewer passing attempts, and the, and the receiving options are what really make Hunt valuable because he's such a great receiving back. But as the offense gets better, it's only good for running backs usually. More scoring opportunities down near the goal line. For Nick Chubb? Uh, well, sure, unless, <laughs> unless what happened last year with Nick Trubb, Chubb's incredible inefficiency inside the 10 yard line says, eh, maybe we use this, this guy who, you know, led the NFL in broken tackles his rookie year and is great. Chubb was so bad inside the five last year. It was really funny. So I, I do, I, I like Kareem hunt 
His value where he's going right now, you don't need him to start. You can start him, and he's a league-winning option, which those are the picks that you really need to be looking for. And, 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 you know, we've talked a lot about the depth mattering more because of COVID. Maybe it's not an injury. Maybe something happens and, and you know, Chubb has to take three weeks off. Well, boom, bam, you've got a great option in Hunt who would be – what would you say if, if Chubb was gone, if, if he, you know, right now said – He's he's opting out in the next hour. Where would Hunt go in the draft? Behind Clyde edwards helaire Probably yeah. so be, running back 9, 10, 11. He would be a second-round pick at the latest. Would you pick, if, if that situation happened, Aaron Jones or Kareem Hunt? Yeah, I would take Kareem Hunt. I would take Kareem Hunt. He, he would be at that's the about back where of the first the, to me. The, it's tough for me between those two, but that's fair. Yeah, I mean, and where he's going now, if that's where he goes, I mean, it fits the Eckler-style mold where you – Yes, you can see problems. Eckler might not get it around the goal line, blah, 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 but Kareem Hunt's a weapon. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I, I wonder where he will go on draft day. Also, most important, today is his birthday. Happy birthday. Oh. Let me guess, 25. Everybody's 25. <laughs> he is, <laughs> as of today, 25. Oh, very nice. Well, what a guess. What a I want. I want to bring up uh, Hollywood Brown. Right. Now, we've, we've talked about him a lot on the show, so I want to bring something a little bit different to the equation. He's right now being drafted, according to uh, Judge Giamatti, in the seven, late seventh round. I don't think that's where he's going to go at all. Um, probably higher or lower? Higher. Okay. Yeah, I think he'll go higher. And uh, I understand it. I mean, you're on one of the best offenses in football. When he was on the field, he was extremely effective, big play type of guy. Um, so I guess I'm going to start a fire and throw a little water on it. But I want this mid- It's a strange technique. No, the technique is important because when you're Because you want steam. That's what you want. That's exactly right. That's the whole point of the mid-round, <laughs> steam. Right. No, the, the, the illusion that you could be under, the, the, the mistake that you could make with a mid-round pick is to draft something, draft a player, and believe he's something he's not, Right. And you have to have a realistic expectation of what you're getting when you add Hollywood Brown to your team from an upside perspective. Jason's talked extensively. He's probably going to end up in one of Jason's my guy spots. And uh, right now he's a seventh round draft pick. But what are you actually, what's the upside for Hollywood Brown coming into season two? He ended up injury plague last year. He was the 46th wide receiver in his rookie season. I just wanted to take a look back and illuminate a little bit. Looking back at the draft class in 2017, looking at the draft class in 2018, all the wide receivers taken in the first uh, three rounds for those two draft classes, what kind of jumps did we see from year one to year two? And that's 23 wide receivers. The 2017 draft class had players uh, like Chad Williams <laughs> and Amara Darbo. Um, mm. and Kenny mm. Galladay. Oh, all right. Yeah, okay. And, and, okay. and Chris Godwin, Mike Williams, and, and a bunch of big names. But what was interesting to me, I went back and looked with no preconceived notions. I just wanted to see what kind of jumps took place. You had jumps last year. The big one would have been Cortland Sutton. Yeah. He went from 51. This year, fantasy finishes in a half point. 51 to 19. Okay? The biggest jump was DJ Chart. Finished the year at 16. That's pretty close to the highest finish you've seen from anybody coming into year two over the last two years. The only player to finish as a one was Juju. He was a, the 16th ranked wide receiver his rookie year, nine in his second year, and that was a year in which Pittsburgh threw the ball more than anybody in football. Sure. A slightly different situation than Hollywood. Everybody else, here's the ceilings that you get coming into year two, even for the Calvin Ridleys, uh, Gallup, uh, Cooper Cup, uh, injury plagued. Chris Godwin jumped up to 20. Galladay up to 21. Um, Curtis Samuel, 48, Mike Williams up to 24 with the big second-year jump. You didn't see any of these players make the wide receiver one leap. So you just have to understand when you're getting Hollywood Brown, there's so much excitement around it. But with the low passing volume, I think you just need to know that you're drafting a player that ceiling is probably – now we have them ranked – I wanted to bring this up. We have them ranked Mid 29, 25, and 28. Mm -hmm. um, I think his ceiling is to finish at about wide receiver 20 for his – uh, which is an amazing value to get in the late seventh round. But if his ADP starts rising, if he gets if all the hype of year two excitement, we saw this with some players last year. We saw this with Juju. Um, it's just something to be aware of, in my opinion. 
Yeah, I, I think that's uh, tempering the expectations. I love Hollywood. He's He probably is going to be one of my my guys because he's got the trifecta of I think they're going to pass the ball a little bit more. He is definitely going to be healthier and the year two leap of just getting better. Which he uh, should. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think he's going to be a, a wide receiver one. The passing volume doesn't seem to be there. So uh, his upside is probably kept. Uh, how far back did that data go? Just the last two sets of rookies that al allowed for two years. So jumps. four, okay. I so gotcha. last 23 players drafted in the first uh, three rounds at wide receiver, which was a bit of a blast from the past. Um, Dante Pettis. Dante no, Pettis. Dante hey. Pettis is in there. Brooks is my guy. <laughs> um, yeah, Traquan Smith is in that category. Oh, yeah. Uh, He's fast. Zay Jones. Oh, yeah. Taewon Taylor. Our I, Darius I did Stewart. like Taewon Taylor. <laughs> Carlos Henderson. Oh, um, Carlos Henderson. Yeah, but those players I kind of threw out of the yeah, out of the mix because they didn't <laughs> show up for year one, so you're probably not showing up for year two. Right. But um, but no, I mean, Hollywood Brown, not to, you know, just don't think that you can punt wide receiver is my point and end up leading your – I don't think you can lead your team with Hollywood Brown. Let's say you go uh, heavy RB and then you're looking at him as your one. I think that would be a mistake. Okay. I think he's a, a good two and his ceiling is that 20 range. Um, well, and the, nice and thing the injury is, thing is something to be aware of, too. But last year on pace for 125 targets before the injury, and obviously Lamar Jackson loves him. And then there's the Antonio Brown piece of the puzzle, too. Sure. Yeah, I mean, he is right now the back of the seventh. So let's say he raises up and he costs you an early seventh. He can still be – he could be your wide receiver four easily at that point. Uh, so you're, you're not drafting him to rely on him. And I do think that well, you're, he's going to be a little bit more volatile in the sense that lower passing volume, but huge gameplay ability to to win you a week. And that's, if you're taking your wide receiver three or four, that's kind of what you want more than just, a, you know, a Cole Beasley-esque, I've got some, you know, I got a guaranteed nine points a game. I think a lot of, yeah, I think a lot of people will be taking him in the, the fifth round, sixth round. But uh, you're right. And, you know, that's what Mark Andrews is on that team, by the way. He's not the kind of, you know, He's touchdown dependent, lower passing volume. He makes a big play, but he can disappear as opposed to players like Kittle and Kelsey. Mm -hmm. um, so Hollywood, great target in the middle rounds. Mike, you're up. So speaking of first-year wide receivers, I wanted to lay out a, a blind player comparison here for you guys. So here were the – Marvin Jones. How did you know it was going to be Marvin Jones? <laughs> it's always Marvin Jones. <laughs> It's not Marvin Jones. Uh, but so here are some players. There are uh, two wide receivers. They were coming in the league, and here their athletic profile. Okay, one wide receiver, six three, two hundred and twenty pounds, ran a four three nine. Like uh, that's absolutely incredible. Marvin Jones. His <laughs> his rookie season, he put up nine hundred fifty nine yards and eight touchdowns. That's an absolute great season. I think I know who that is. Okay. Okay. Well, how about this rookie? Six foot, 210, so, you know, comparable in size, not the exact same size. Ran a 4.35, and his rookie year, he put up 919 yards and seven touchdowns. And what are we right, supposed to do here? What are we I'm supposed just, to do here? Like, I'm, just, I'm just laying out that, that those are very, very close, right? Those are similar players, similar production their rookie year. That's Julio Jones and Terry McLaurin. They are both... Very large. They are both very athletic. There is a difference in in perception, though, because Julio Jones was a top 10 pick and Terry McLaurin fell to the third round. So people still think about Terry McLaurin a little bit different, and he is dropping down into the middle rounds, and I think he is an absolute phenomenal target for a breakout. He wins in all aspects of the game as a wide receiver, Reception Perception, which is, if you're not familiar with it, it is a methodology available in the Ultimate Draft Kit that takes a look at route running by wide receivers. Matt Harmon charted Terry McLaurin and said, this is the third best rookie against press coverage that he has charted, the top two being Odell Beckham and Tyreek Hill. So that puts him in pretty solid company. Terry McLaurin should have easily hit 1,000 yards as a rookie. He unfortunately missed a few games. And, and like I said, his comps 
in terms of production, the rookie year, he's right next to Julio. He's right next to Juju. He's right next to Andre Johnson. He's a top 4% speed player. He is the absolute unquestioned number one on this team. You know, we, we had a little bit of that offseason. Uh, who, who was the player? It, was, it wasn't Antonio Brown, but they were uh, Sammy Watkins. I think they were. there was rumor mill stuff that Sammy Watkins was going to go there. No. And then they had they lost Kelvin Harmon to an ACL, so they brought in Dontrell Inman. Uh, Antonio has some Gandy Golden. Look, Terry McLaurin is the number one guy on this team, and you might be thinking, okay, well, Dwayne Haskins, it's a situation. I get it. Dwayne Haskins, he's not my favorite quarterback heading into next year, but we saw signs that he was getting better. He did finish, this is Dwayne Haskins, he finished with two divisional games with a passer rating over 120 in both of those games. Six of his seven passing touchdowns came in the final three games. Dwayne Haskins, the game started to slow down. He started to get better. Now he has an entire offseason where he's uh, the, the starter. Like You started off with Case Keenum. Haskins was going to be a project. They knew that. He was forced in. But now he gets the he gets the chance to shine and show that he's worth that top. Uh, I think it was a top fifteen pick in the NFL draft. But Terry McLaurin, man, I I don't I don't fully understand his draft pick except for the Dwayne Haskins part, the talent, the production as a rookie. Guys don't guys don't put up over nine hundred yards as rookies. Like we get kind of jaded and think that it happens all the time, but it really does not. He had. Really, really strong monster production for a rookie. And I think that he, if he, like Andy's talking about, second year, if Terry McLaurin takes that step, like Terry McLaurin could be a top 20 wide receiver. I, yeah, I mean, the, the, the fact he's the, the go-to guy is important to the equation. I mean, when I think about uh, more probable outcomes to me for Terry McLaurin, it's the Calvin Ridley experience. It's the uh, great rookie season, identical second season. I mean, last year, he had a lot of targets as a rookie. I mean, he was almost 100 targets in 14 games. Um, I don't know if you want to see him stand next to Julio Jones phys <laughs> physically. But, I mean, you're not going to get complaints on the talent level on any in any regard from Terry McLaurin's. Uh, are you comfortable with him as your two all season long? Yes. Okay. And what is his ceiling? When you talk about year two, obviously he didn't, you know, um, his his ceiling to me is a top fifteen wide receiver, like right even in this in this yes. Washington situation. Yes, we have we have seen wide receivers when they're the unquestioned one, they are the target hog, and they have the talent to match the the opportunity. We've seen bad teams sustain uh, huge outlier wide receiver one performances before. Yeah, I I do think it will have to. It requires Haskins to step forward to really sure. take uh you know if if you look at this season because in in the realm of uh possibility you say okay he was he was good with Haskins last year he was about as good as he was with Keenum well that's fine but you're not drafting him to be what he was last year right now when you draft him you have to you're drafting him to be better than that to take that step forward and I don't think that can happen unless Haskins steps forward I mean you brought it up you said you thought Haskins is the reason that he's not being drafted yes. as a top guy. It is the reason, and I think it's a fair reason. Uh, but we like the talent, and you heard it here. He is Julio Jones, right? Terry McLaurin, <laughs> Julio Jones. Incredible. He meant to say Mike Wallace. Oh. No, uh, he, he's great. I wanted to look at uh, something real quick before we leave Terry McLaurin because uh, I've been looking at it all week when thinking about players like uh, McLaurin, because I don't think Washington is at the top of people's lists for offenses to target offenses to target or teams that are going to be in the upper half of the NFL, right? Um, when you're thinking about records <laughs> and where they're going to end up. But last year, if you take a look at who finished in the top 12, and I like looking at this at every position, um, teams that made the playoffs, that type of situation. At wide receiver, you can do a lot of damage on a bad team. And that that's kind of my point. I mean, yeah. um, you know, Cooper Cup probably doesn't fit that mold. They didn't make the playoffs, but they weren't a bad team. Kenny Galladay was the sixth wide receiver last year. He was on a really bad team. Devontae Parker. Uh, Kenny Galladay also had a bad quarterback situation. Too. Yeah, Devontae Parker finished seventh at the position. Keenan Allen finished eighth. Those were all losing teams. Uh, Allen Robinson finished 11th on a losing team. And, you know, 
Mike Evans, Jarvis Landry, the next two guys on that list. Not great teams. Right. So DJ Chark as well. So there, there is a precedent for players, obviously, in today's NFL where you're coming back, where you're throwing the ball. It's one of the reasons you like DJ Chark mm-hmm. um, for them to be able to finish at that level. Love me a bad defense. <laughs> Love now, fantasy loves uh, a bad defense. And and over the course of the year, I wonder if that caps your, you know, boom games when you don't have a quarterback you can rely on to have that kind of monstrous, you know, performance where a team comes out. It's not like Washington is going to come out and mop the floor with an, the opposition on an offensive perspective. Right. So that three touchdown game, that monstrous yeah, difference yeah, a, making yeah, a, a game three, might not happen, but a, a three touchdown game that yeah, I I won't say there's going to be a lot of those for Terry McLaurin, but built into Terry McLaurin's talent and is one play. Yeah, I mean, he ha- he has the Deshaun Jackson ability to one play. I've I've made my uh, I, I've met my threshold for my fantasy points for the week. But on top of that, he's going to have a huge target share. It won't be just four targets a game for Terry McLaurin. Yeah. 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 I think we're all fans of of Terry McLaurin. The guy that I want to bring up is someone that is, I, I I think right now, criminally undervalued. He's probably, you, you said who's your favorite mid-round target. This guy is quickly becoming my favorite mid-round target. It's Tyler Lockett. Unlimited. Oh. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Fuck clan. If you haven't seen these Unlimited. videos of Mr. Unlimited. What oh is goodness. happening? Russell Wilson is losing his mind. No, I he has to be trolling. He He's has trying to, to have a personality. No, that's he what's can't, happening. That can't be a robot trying to have a personality. <laughs> that's what you're seeing. New software? Uh, Unlimited. He's trying out his new AI chip. There's no way that those are real. Here's the thing. Well, they're real because you could go watch them. Yeah, <laughs> and and he has filmed it and prepared questions from the background. I mean, this is a whole thing. This He's, is his new alter ego. He still has not deleted the tweets. Like, they're still there. Oh, which is... Because he's so smart, he's trolling us. That has to be the has only be. thing I can... Well, let me ask you this. I'm how, guessing there's going to be more. Oh, there's definitely going to be more. You know how many? <laughs> Unlimited! Unlimited. Uh, Sorry, okay. uh, that's, that's <laughs> no, not that's, fair to you. It's not fair to Tyler. But uh, here's the thing about Russell Wilson. He's a pretty freaking good quarterback. Yes, I mean, he's, he's very good. He's Would you say he's the number two quarterback in the league? That's how I view him. Maybe three if you, you – you know, Lamar Jackson sh- certainly should be in that uh, range right now. But my point is he's phenomenal. He's going to get the job done. We don't know for sure if their defense is better or worse or the same as last year. But we do know that their running back core is a little bit shakier coming into this season than last season. Rashad Penny is injured. The backup now is Carlos Hyde. Chris Carson is injured but should be okay come season time. Tyler Lockett is exceptionally good. You you talk about Mount Harmon's reception perception. Yep. He's always shown very well there as a wide receiver. Two years ago, he got the shot to be the one. He was the wide receiver 15. Last year, gets the shot to be the one. Oh, no, DK Metcalf comes in, puts up 907. Great. He was the wide receiver 14. He is a really good wide receiver, and that was – you talk about, well, there's limited passing volume. Well, there there was – yes, there was limited passing volume. When you are, he was you are the, correct. That you happened. Are, you are correct, and he was the wide receiver fourteen, and he was the wide. He's he is a top fifteen wide receiver. Like that's what Tyler Lockett is, and that's with the low passing volume. Should they let Russ cook, which we've talked about recently? Maybe these videos are coming out because he's like, oh, I know some. They're going to take the reins off, and I'm going to be Mister Unlimited. If he has to throw more for any reason, let's say jealous his, of the Beast Mode brand. He's like, I got to get my own brand. I know what to do. <laughs> Keep searching. Step one, motor oil in my hair. Step two, unlimited. unlimited. All right. Um, I can't even take it. I mean, so Tyler Lockett is being driven down by DK Metcalf. People are afraid. They don't know who the number one is, who the number two is. Um, DK Metcalf is great. He's phenomenal for this offense. I, I think he's. I think they're both going to be very good. But in truth, he is, ironically, more limited when it comes to you know what he could do he's not he's not the every route wide receiver one on you know he's going to be looking for Tyler Lockett when that doesn't happen he's got a big body in in DK Metcalf 
Tyler Lockett is being drafted well behind where he should finish. Um, he is consistent as well. You you talk about the inconsistencies, you know, last half of last year. Mm -hmm. Russell Wilson uh, let us down for fantasy after that smoking hot start. Um, and you think, okay, well, is he consistent or is he going to give you a bunch of dud games? And the reality is he is actually pretty darn consistent. His bust games percentage wise over the last two seasons with uh, that team is is he's the uh, 14th best as far as fewest bust games and if you look at the guys ahead of him you have Antonio Brown which this only accounts games played he was pretty good when he was playing yep. Devonte Adams Julio Jones Hopkins Edelman Michael Thomas AJ Green again only counting the games that he played in Thielen Robert Woods and Mike Evans this is a list of superstar fantasy options and then it's Tyler Lockett. He has one of the highest rates of wide receiver two plus games, one of the lowest rates of busting. He has the best quarterback or one of the best quarterbacks in the league. He's done it for two years in a row and people don't want him. I don't, I don't get it. I would love for him to be my wide receiver two that I can get after, after having three running backs on my roster. So you think I think it's a ceiling fatigue. Yes. Yes. It's a ceiling fatigue. It's, it's, he can't be a top five wide receiver I think it's that he just like if you line the players up like if he stands behind DK Metcalf you literally you, you can't, can't see him. him no you can't like, a, he just disappears or if he stands behind Terry McLaurin have you heard how sure or no. Julio he's I mean Tyler Lockett is not he's not a big boy but he if the targets came let's just say this the the low passing volume the low passing volume he's been a top 15 wide receiver two years in a row no reason to think he won't be a top 15 wide receiver this year. But let's just say that the passing volume does open up, that Pete Carroll says, all right, Russ, you've been begging for me to let you really lead the offense. We're going to change. And I don't think that that's a, a zero chance. I, I, I think that they could let Russell – Greater than 2%. No. Yes. No. I think it's greater than 2%. But, <laughs> but here's my point. Metcalf to should benefit more from that. Yeah. As well. Yeah. I mean, every receiver would benefit if they let them throw the ball more. But the Lockett is not viewed as a superstar talent the way that other wide receivers are. And he is. The last 180 targets for Tyler Lockett, he has ended with 139 receptions, 2,022 yards, and 18 touchdowns. If you compare that with this, with the last 180 targets of Michael Thomas and Julio Jones, it's Michael Thomas would have 149 receptions, 1,700 yards, nine touchdowns. Julio, 118 receptions, 1,600 yards, and nine touchdowns. So on a per target pace, Tyler Lockett is incredible. I think, uh, I, he reminds me a lot of uh, T.Y. Hilton, the perception of T.Y. Hilton as well. You know, a player that's probably underestimated from a pure talent perspective, in part because he's not prototypical in size. In part because you know, you know, Hilton's a smaller guy. He's probably the exact same size as Lockett, and both of those players don't fit the. I'm not Des Bryant or Julio Jones, and I'm not Kenny Galladay. Terry McLaurin, <laughs> who's seven foot four. Yeah, but you know those those stats to me just show he is a he is a star talent. If they open the offense up, he does have upside that I don't think we realize. And shout out to Jacob Rickroad on the. Uh, 180 target pace. <laughs> T.Y. Hilton, 5'10", 183. Tyler Lockett, 5'10", 182. So I, I think I was, was kind of spot on there. I mean, if you were playing uh, the game at the fair, yes, you you would have won. If they put on each other's uniforms and swapped teams, they no fit. one would notice. That's right. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's a good point. I think at, at where he's going, you may see this every year. Because DK Metcalf draws a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. and uh, the ceiling fatigue isn't there with DK Metcalf. The ceiling is unknown with DK Metcalf. Ironically, that is the player who I thought when you were giving Julio's rookie mm. year. What was Julio's rookie year again? 950-something uh, Nin yards. Yeah, because DK Metcalf was 907 and was well, big and ran. Di Metcalf was 900. Julio was 959. Well, it's interesting because the uh, you know we talked on yesterday's episode about confidence associated to quarterback and that's where Metcalf stands out compared to a McLaurin is you have sure. arguably the best quarterback and if that's two three four percent if you get unlimited Russell Wilson DK Metcalf is going to do some damage and he's going to do it in the end zone that's the Agreed. biggest thing it's like Russ has shown 
that he can throw more touchdowns than everybody else on fewer passes. It is just in his DNA to do it. Sometimes uh, at a very low probability, as announced by Mike Wright. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, I'm going to throw Ronald Jones out there. Uh, it's been a long road for Ronald Jones and I. When he came into the NFL, he decided to make uh, the, take the rookie season off. Right now he's going in the eighth round. That's a ludicrous point for him to be going. If if things stand as they are right now going into drafts, he's not going to be an eighth-round draft pick. No, he's he's heating up. He's heating up. I mean, Arians came out and talked about the fact that this was yesterday. This was uh, full-on yeah. hype train material. Be, be careful with the news. Yeah, no question. But Arians said, look, he, he, Ronald Jones is going to be the guy. All the anecdotal evidence of his offseason and the time he spent, the efficiency that he showed in the offense last year. The comical part about Ronald Jones and where he's going in drafts right now is the fact that he was literally, uh, what did he finish as, the running back 26 last year? Is that, is I don't that, have that in front of me. That I think he finished right around that 26 range, and he's being drafted. That's about where we have him. I think that you have a situation with Ronald Jones where he's a guaranteed lock as a mid-round value because you don't get running backs. Running back 26. 26. Yeah, yeah you don't, and he's being drafted at 36, according to the ADP data we have today, which I think is kind of probably not going to come to fruition. But I brought it up earlier. The, f- the fourth-round running backs last year – they were Marlon Mack and Derrick Henry in fantasy drafts. The fifth round running backs were Miles Sanders and Austin Eckler last year. That range of draft picks is a great place to find value at the running back position, regardless of whether you invested heavily or lightly on running back to start the draft. They're the hardest position to come by. And, you know, people want to project through two different lenses for Tampa Bay. And I think both of them could cause you some issues. One is the the Bruce Arians lens and what he does with uh, the running back position. Do we trust that? Or do we trust kind of maybe more the Belichick? Maybe you give credit to Belichick. Or maybe it's Brady that likes to have this mix of players. When he was in New England, the only thing you saw in the backfield for Brady's running backs was big boy, Ben Jarvis Green Ellis, right. Jonas Gray, LeGarrette Blunt, LeGarrette Blunt, Stephen Ridley. And then that was always combined with pass catcher. Little boy. Sh- Shane Vereen, Deion Lewis. James White, uh, going back to Kevin Falk days. And so you've had that combination. And really, it's kind of shaping up to be that type of combination in Tampa Bay. So understanding what you get with Ronald Jones is I think you need to look at it through the lens of you're not getting a three down back under any circumstance. Yes, he was technically, statistically, the best pass catcher out of the backfield. That's why you went out and drafted Keyshawn, Keyshawn Vaughn. That's why you paid for LaShawn McCoy. Mm-hmm. Bruce Arians came out yesterday, talked about Ronald Jones. He talked about him as the guy, and that means first and second down to me. Mm -hmm. I think the best lens to look at the backfield for Tampa Bay is not to to look historically at everything Bruce Arians has ever done or everything Tom Brady's ever done. I think it's best to look through the lens of what will Tampa Bay be as an offense. Will they be able to move the football? Will there be scoring opportunities for this team? We think, yes, they'll move the football. Yes, they'll be a winning team. Yes, they'll have goal line opportunities. Those three things combined with, look, LaShawn McCoy is not going to be able to be your workhorse. Keyshawn Vaughn, the rookie, is not going to be able to be your workhorse. For goodness sakes, Daria Agumbawale is not going to be your workhorse. Mm-hmm. Peyton Barber is gone. That puts a basement to Ronald Jones that I'm really, really comfortable with. Certainly at RB36 in the eighth round where he's going now, but all the way up into the fourth, fifth round, I don't remember where you took him yesterday, Jason, in our three wide receiver mock. Yeah, it was probably a perfect fifth spot. Fifth or sixth round, <laughs> probably the perfect spot. I just think it's kind of a – it's it's a no-brainer what? pick. Yeah. And a no-brainer pick and Ronald Jones in the same sentence have not been uh, Certainly nothing equivalent. that's come out of my no, mouth no, over the last couple the, of years. When he was a rookie, it was a no-brainer pick. Right. You, did, you, you didn't you, pick You don't him. have a brain if you pick him. <laughs> Either way. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> But it's kind of impressive to look at what happened last year and this offense not being in those positions all the time with Peyton Barber in the mix and seeing Ronald Jones has enough explosive plays to get you the t- a top 26 finish in fantasy. So I think he's very, very safe this year, which is kind of not necessarily the way you've looked at it. When you try to work out a murky backfield, you don't think there's a safe option. He feels very safe to me in the middle rounds. Murky backfields are where big step forwards come from. If you look back year after year and you go, we're not sure who's going to be the guy here. 
oftentimes someone becomes the guy, and, and I, I do yeah. agree with. It's also that. where swamp monsters live. <laughs> live as you well. put your hand in. Sometimes it's covered in it's leeches. Very murky. Sometimes you get the catfish. You ever gone swimming? In like you know, I've, where you can't see anything. I have swam little, in some Minnesota lakes where people come out with leeches. Yes. Oh, oh man, gross. People like every time or like it, it's possible. I didn't. I <laughs> think, <laughs> thankfully I know. <laughs> make a difference to you? <laughs> yeah, it makes a like difference. Percentage odds? Would you swim I, in a lake with a fifty percent leech rate? If you're telling me that there's uh, leeches in this water and someone has come out with one on them before, but. You know, people are swimming all the time and they're not coming out with them. I, 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 I might get in that water. Okay. But if this is like, hey, go swim, but you know this, I, you're I coming out leeched. with leeches. My sister did, though. Oh, yeah, I'm out. No promises that you won't have a few leeches in the Ronald Jones situation. <laughs> he's He's got leech potential. But, Mike, why don't you close us down on this mid-roll madness? All right. Yeah, the name was already mentioned, but we got we to gotta talk about him. Wait, what's funny now? Mid-roll madness. Oh. oh. Is that what I said? <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, that's fine. Whatever, it's all the same. Who cares? It's Nobody's madness. listening anymore. Look, I want to talk about <laughs> DJ Chark, who is going in the middle rounds. He is going right now as the uh, wide receiver 22 at the back of the fifth round. This is a player coming off a 1,000-yard breakout season. I am hot and bothered under the collar by DJ Chark. Jason's pretty close yeah. with me as well. Andy is more balanced on his view of DJ Chark, but even Andy's... Like being a little bit more hesitant, still ranked way way above his ADP. Like yeah. that DJ Chark to me is an absolute no brainer pick. Last year he finished as the wide receiver sixteen and a half point in a really rough situation. There was quarterback to mold. The team was not great. The defense was bad. And he, here's what he has going for him. I mean, number one, he was a second round pick. The draft equity was there. Look, we all missed on DJ Chark. Guilty. I like. I liked other players on this team. A lot of other fantasy players liked different wide receivers on this team. Yeah, Didi last yeah, year Didi, with like, Nick Foles. And Chris Conley was a f big free agent acquisition. But DJ Chark, athletic monster, 6'4", 200-pound guy with top 4% uh, speed, he's the one that broke out. I'm moving forward with that. They, yeah. have, J they have Jay Gruden as the offensive coordinator. Jay Gruden offenses – have finished in the top 15 in passing touchdowns in six of his nine seasons. Like They are very productive offenses. DJ Chark even had an ankle, ankle injury that derailed the last 25% of his season. They will have to win with offense. And, and this is my attempt to uh, try and convince Andy... To move him into my top 12 no, 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 like no. you guys? No, no, no. Certainly okay. not. But just to have a little bit more confidence in him... Because have a little bit more confidence in what Gardner Minshew actually did. Like I have more, far more confidence in Gardner Minshew as a quarterback than I do in Dwayne Haskins when I'm talking about Chark and McLaurin, which is why I have Chark ranked higher. But here's some interesting stuff for Gardner Minshew. We love Kyler Murray. Kyler Murray looked like a very good passer, looked like he's going to turn into a very good passer at, uh, at the quarterback position. Gardner Minshew averaged more passing yards per game than Kyler Murray. That includes the two games where he had to come in uh, at relief. Like He didn't even get to play the whole game. He had more passing touchdowns than Kyler. He had a better passer rating than Kyler Murray. And this was with the Jacksonville defense already bad. They were the 21st ranked defense last year. So the, He had more wins than Kyler. He had more wins than Kyler Murray. And here's, here's the wild one. Now, it's a little bit of a cherry-picked stat. But I still like Love it. it. Love it. I still like it because it's fun. Only four rookies ever have thrown 20-plus touchdowns and under 10 interceptions their rookie year. Dak Prescott, Robert Griffin III, Dan Marino, and Gardner Minshew. The dude was efficient. He had a bit of a fumbling problem, so... <laughs> Like that's why I'm saying it's a bit cherry picked. He still turned the ball over, but when it came to passing, he was making good decisions. He loved going to DJ Chark. Uh, DJ Chark averaged eight targets a game. I think he is an absolute no brainer pick if you're looking for a wide receiver in the fifth and sixth round range. Here, here's uh, and I, let me just piggyback because I think he is a no brainer pick. But I want to make sure and and this Andy I think will will love hearing me say this. I have him ranked as as my wide receiver twelve. That's just where the stats lie. I think that's uh, has a a high probability of being possible. 
That doesn't mean that I would draft him there. That is Correct. so far above his ADP that if you can draft him where he is actually aver- you know, going in your average draft, that's where the real value is on Chark. Don't just yes. reach for his potential. The See reason the he's on your roster all the time is because of what you think of him compared to where you're able to get him. Correct. Look, Jacksonville is difficult. I like Jay Gruden. I, I've been an advocate of Jay Gruden for years while he's stuck in the kind of personnel, uh, what are we what are we using? Swamps? Is that the word? Is that the <laughs> sure. theme of the day? In Washington for all those years. So there is this place where I have a lot of confidence in Jay Gruden to manufacture an offense. He's brought in some pieces that he likes. They drafted Chenault. They have Chris Thompson. Um, the hard part with Gardner for me is Gardner was thrust into the situation. Mm-hmm. Teams had never seen him. His draft pedigree wasn't one that came in where it was like, man, this guy's a locked and loaded. He's a six-round pick. Right. He wasn't a guarantee to be take the next step in the NFL. So that's my hesitation with him. The numbers don't lie. He's had a really successful rookie season, and when you compare it against other rookie seasons, he, he was wonderful. He did a great job, and I think he can continue that. I also think DJ Chark is one of the players that reminds me most of a young A.J. Green. I mean, yes. he's humongous. He makes contested catches consistently. I've got him at 18. I have no apologies for that. I think that's a great spot as ADP is 22. Um, and he was somebody that carried fantasy rosters off the waiver wire. You talked about the quick question of the day to kind of put a bow on this whole episode. Spending on DJ Chark at the top of the year last year, when you saw the breakout happening, mm-hmm. it, it you know I know uh, Al Borland in in the office. He he picked up DJ Chark with some fab cash. I don't know what you had to spend on him, but he was a stalwart of your very very bad lineup. Yeah, for <laughs> so many weeks you needed him bad. <laughs> so it's obvious why you spent, and it was such a smart move considering uh, your other roster. Probably your best player. <laughs> Off the waivers. Only only here at the Fantasy Footballers can we give credit <laughs> and destroy you in the same sentence. But no, he, he he had a breakout season. I think the I think moving forward with him as the bona fide one on the team, uh, especially with what he did specifically with Gardner, is the way to go. And he has a lot of upside. Um, I hope Jay Gruden can... like I know Jacksonville fans don't like the way we talk about the team and projecting the future. And Mike might have picked wide receivers from the two teams that may finish with the, they may have the first and second pick in next year's draft. They might. I mean, they're in, I don't care. They're in contention, <laughs> but uh, you know, and, it, but a lot of that falls on the defense. The defense has been decimated in Jacksonville. It's been completely stripped bare of that, of that amazing roster that they had a couple of years ago. Clay is out the door now too. Maybe that'll mean some great things for Gardner. Certainly a possibility. I believe in Jay Gruden and I hope that Gardner is legit because the NFL needs him. Yes. Because he's spectacular. He's he's a very fun guy. And uh, if he has a monster year and DJ Chark does, uh, I don't know what we're going to do with Mike Wright, but he's going to have some <laughs> new, he's going to have some new tattoos. Final day of Pristine Week, by the way. Check him out at pristineauction.com. Use the code PW2020. Ten dollars off your first item. Check it out. Pristineauction.com. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.